May I have your attention, please? Uh, we are going to begin our program, so those of you who are enjoying the delicious lunch, um, grab your plates, find a seat. There are quite a few up here in the front, and uh, begin to keep your ears open to join the conversation. So I would like to uh, welcome everyone to CSIS today for the latest meeting in the Chevron Forum on Development. The forum is part of CSIS's broader project on U.S. leadership in development. And I am actually wearing two hats today, one as a hat with on the CSIS Board of Trustees, and the second is a hat that I sit on the Leadership Council of the Initiative for Global Development, who helped sponsor today's event. So I am delighted to see both CSIS and IGD working together. The Initiative for Global Development is a global alliance of business leaders united by a common vision of reducing global poverty through increased investment and economic development in frontier markets. IGD's Frontier 100 network consists of CEOs from Africa, South Asia, the US, and Europe who build relationships and share knowledge to catalyze economic growth in sectors like energy, that have a high potential to reduce poverty. Joe Brandt, Paul Hanrahan, Rob Mossbacker are all members of Frontier 100 Network, and Contour Global and AES are great examples of companies that have managed to be successful and to help communities in which they operate. We're grateful to IGD and Frontier 100 for inspiring today's event and bringing us today's panelists. Today's discussion on investment in Africa's power sector is particularly important. For those of us who've been working and living in Africa, you know that one of the most significant problems is a lack of infrastructure. We are fortunate to have a distinguished panel, so let me introduce them quickly. Paul Hanrahan, who is uh, just putting up his hand right now, is the outgoing president and CEO of AES Corporation. AES is a Fortune 200 power company with operations in 28 countries around the world, including in Africa. And I know he has a personal interest and passion for Africa. So welcome, Paul. Joseph Brandt is the, uh, Joseph, would you like to raise your hand? Thank you. Uh, is the president and CEO of Contour Global, which he founded in 2005 to invest in, develop, and operate power generation facilities in underserved and overlooked foreign markets. So thank you for being with us, Joe. And Rob Mossbacher, Jr., who is a longtime friend, thank you for raising your hand, Rob, is the former president and CEO of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, or OPIC, a position that he served in from 2005 to 2010. He uh, was one of the best presidents uh, for OPIC uh, that I have seen in the past 20 years, and I sat on the board. So it is delightful to see you here, Rob. And Rob is also the chairman of Mossbacher Energy Company. And uh, lastly, raising his hand, is David Pumphrey. Thank you, David. Uh, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow at CSIS Energy and National Security Program, who will moderate this top-notch panel. And I hope David will also speak up, because David is a really deep, knowledgeable, interesting speaker and thinker. It is important for all of us to be thinking about these models uh, for best development practices by corporations, with governments, and with communities around the world. So let me now turn over this podium to Richard Downey, Deputy Director of CSIS Africa Program, who will provide some introductory remarks on the state of Africa's power sector and investment therein. So once again, thank you all for joining us, and let us begin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Henrietta, for the introductions. Welcome, everyone, to uh, CSIS. Um, when I think about the, the factors which hold back economic development in Africa, and we think about this a lot on our program, the poor state of the domestic uh, power sector comes very near the top of the list. 
Uh, it's an unfortunate reality that much of the African continent still lacks access to power and electricity. If we look at sub-Saharan Africa, the World Bank suggests that less than 10% of rural households have access to electricity, and the overall access rate is below 25%. The entire, gen uh, the entire generation capacity of the 49 countries of sub-Saharan Africa is approximately uh, 70 gigawatts, uh, which means nothing to me, but is on a similar level uh, to that of Spain, Spain alone. Now, this weakness uh, acts as an immeasurable drag on economic growth. Uh, blackouts or unreliable power supplies force businesses to scale back for halt production, as well as deterring, of course, outside investment. Now, at the same time, domestic energy demand is rising due to uh, Africa's expanding population and also the growing number of middle-class consumers. Uh, unfortunately, power rationing has become an all-too-frequent phenomenon across the continent, uh, and the likes recently of uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Burundi, to name a few. And it's been linked to social unrest also in, uh, in recent months in Senegal. What's doubly frustrating is that this deficit of domestic energy provision often occurs in countries which have abundant energy resources. Now, it's an often quoted example, but Nigeria, uh, the largest producer of oil in sub-Saharan Africa, is also the largest importer of electricity generators in the world, uh, about 2 million units uh, per year. Sim simply, uh, citizens and businesses cannot rely on the state to provide them with a reliable power supply. And for all the petroleum it produces, Nigeria's refining capacity doesn't come even close to meeting domestic demand. And at the same time, look only at all the, glass, the, the gas flaring uh, that goes on in Nigeria. Uh, here we have a precious resource that is literally being burned off at great cost to the environment when it could be put to good purpose. Now, Nigeria's challenges are replicated across the African continent where investment in the power sector is held back by a raft of factors, uh, including regulatory and legal structures, infrastructure gaps, and access to financing. On infra infrastructure alone, uh, an African Development Bank study last year estimated that the total cost of bridging the continent's infrastructure gap over the next 10 years will be about $93 billion a year, and about 40% of that is in the uh, power sector. Uh, we have a new nation of South Sudan uh, in Africa embarking upon life as an independent nation. Uh, large investments are uh, taking place there in infrastructure, but most of them currently are on things like road construction and agriculture, uh, not on energy infrastructure. Uh, as of last year, foreign donors were supporting just one uh, elect uh, electricity generation project, for example. So in sum, there's a huge uh, untapped demand waiting to be met. Uh, and, of course, the private sector has a huge role to play. Uh, but at the moment, according to the IFC, only 5% of sub-Saharan Africa's power production capacity is generated uh, by the private sector. So there's this big need, and, and that's why we're really glad to have these industry leaders here today to share their experiences of how they're going about it, and hopefully uh, to encourage others to follow suit as well. And indeed, uh, there are some encouraging initiatives to discuss. One area for example, where there's been uh, exponential growth has been the renewable energy sector, where we've seen uh, big investments in uh, solar power, in wind installations, uh, hydropower, and biomass uh, energy. So I'm going to conclude on, on this note of uh, recognizing the challenges, but also uh, pointing towards uh, some of the opportunities. Uh, with that, I'll turn to uh, my colleague David to uh, uh, get the panel underway. So thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. And Henrietta, for those uh, introductions, it is really a, a great pleasure to be moderating uh, this this panel, um, principally because I don't think it's going to require much work from me. I think these are knowledgeable people, and I think will uh, offer great insights. So, I will um, get to them in just a second. But first, the interest of our uh, energy and national security program, I think, is something I wanted to highlight. As we're looking at future energy markets and the shape of energy markets, as well as the future for, for greenhouse gas emissions, developing countries are key. We've seen this with China and India, um, that they are dominating the growth. If you look at any projection that's out there, you're seeing that developing countries are where the growth in energy consumption will be. The space for Africa to develop is huge, and Richard's given some of the numbers about the lack of service, energy services 
in Africa and the need to develop those services. And the pathway that Africa chooses has very important uh, implications for global energy security and as well as greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it is really critical from both sides of this picture, looking at the development side, and Richard has laid this out, that energy is critical for development purposes. Without it, you can't provide the, the electricity you need for education, for health care. Without reliable uh, electricity services, you can't really have a strong industrial base. So it is critical to be moving these forward. And what, how that develops, I think, will be affecting all of us, not just from a point of view of development, but also in what we face in terms of energy and uh, greenhouse gas changes. My uh, rather long career with DOE, I worked for some time on uh, African energy issues. Um, about 20 years ago, I was working uh, with South Africa on questions as they had moved from apartheid into a majority rule and how do they face um, bringing electricity services. And that really taught me how daunting this task is and how it is not just governments who will pay for it. It's going to have to be money mobilized worldwide, principally through the private sector. And that's why I think this panel is really the panel that needs to tell, tell us what, what will they need to be able to bring the kind of investment dollars and the technology that will help Africa address uh, their concerns. So with that, just a little bit of introduction, let's get started. I think um, first, um, what we're going to do is, is very informal. So we didn't set this up with uh, PowerPoint presentations. And uh, any of you, and I see some of my colleagues from the uh, energy world who come to our events know that's unusual for us because we like mind-numbing uh, PowerPoints to start the, the presentation first. That seems to be part of the energy world. But this time, we're going to have it much more as a conversation, and hopefully I can get the, the panelists talking amongst themselves. But I'll start out with, with Paul asking you a question to get started from your perspective. You're, you're heading up a very large and well-established international power company, and you've had experiences all over the world, and you've got some operations in Africa, uh, but, but relatively small ones. And uh, I guess the question would be, what do you see as the challenges uh, for your company and, and any private company that's moving into this, thinking about moving into this marketplace, and what kind of changes do you think might be necessary to, to make it more attractive for private capital to come into the, to that marketplace? Well, well thanks, David, um, and, and thanks for having me here today. Um, a, quick a, a quick answer to your question is, we need a track record of successes in Africa. Just to set the context, AES is a global power company we have two businesses in Africa, one in Nigeria, which is a barge-mounted generation plant. Um, and we made it barge-mounted because we were so confident of the track record of getting paid that we put these gas turbines on barges so we could remove them just in case we didn't get paid. Unfortunately, um, the harbor is silted up. There's no way this thing's ever going to leave. Um, the second investment is, is much more significant and relevant, I think, and that's the investment in Cameroon. Cameroonian government, working with the World Bank IFC, privatized their entire electric sector in one step. They did this in 2000. Um, we bought a controlling interest in it and have been there since. Um, it, it's interesting. We took over the business, and you could not have picked a worse time to take it over. Um, there, the country, had, it, it's 93 percent hydro in Cameroon, so it really depends on uh, rainfall. We took it over after an extended drought. And the government, because it was going to hand it over, thought it would be easier for them to drain the reservoirs than to burn oil, um, which they did. So we took over. We had empty reservoirs. Um, we had no rainfall. And we had a bunch of people who were looking at the newly privatized electric system and saying, how come the lights are out? <coughs> so it was not a great way to get started. Um, since then, though, it's actually started to go well. What we had to do first, and I think in any system, you've got to fix, you've got to, you've got to follow the money chain. You've got to start with the customers paying the distribution company, distribution company paying the generator. Um, we, so a lot of fixing at all, all ends of that. We had to put new systems in place. We had to improve collections. Uh, we had to eliminate some of the, the leakage that might be associated with fraud. We also had to add thermal generation because you can't have a system that's entirely reliant on rainfall. So we started out with uh, under 800 megawatts. We're over 1,000 megawatts today, and we're building a plant now that would take it to 1,200 megawatts. So we're talking about 60% increase in generation capacity, but a lot more is needed. We've invested about $800 million into this business since we've been there. Um, 
it's it's been a I think it's 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 one of the few um, positive stories success stories about privatization in Africa. One of the best things that we're doing now is we're expanding the grid to people don't have access to electricity. Um, this this uh, grid supplies about half a million customers. Um, we are adding about 60,000 customers a year to the grid. And we're also, uh, so by 2021, we will have increased from about half a million customers to 1.5 million customers. So that's a big achievement. I, I think the biggest issue with, with all the African, um, sub-Saharan African electricity privatizations, IPPs, whatever you want to call it, it all comes down to the, um, basically, can you, can you trust that if you sign up to a deal that looks like it's going to work, will, will the governments, in fact, ensure that they work? And I think that's a role where uh, uh, the U.S. government, uh, multilateral associations, the development banks can play a, a key role in making sure that it's, it's not that difficult to set up a system that works and that's uh, credit worthy, that, that makes sense. It's making sure that you implement according to those rules. And we found in Cameroon, and, and there's always going to be a temptation to when things get difficult, when there's high inflation, to cut back on the tariffs. But I think uh, the Cameroonian government realizes establishing that track record is going to be what's required to attract more capital into the sector. But I think other countries are going to have to do the same thing. Joe, Con Contour Global is a relative newcomer. You're um, a smaller player in this field, um, but you've decided that Africa is a place that you want to play and has opportunities uh, for you. So can you describe a little bit about your activities and how you evaluate um, investments in Africa, um, say, versus other parts of the world? Sure. Uh, thanks, David. We are, we're a privately held company, and so our, we, we started in late 2005. Our first full year was 2006, and focused on uh, development in um, emerging markets with a particular emphasis emphasis on sub-Saharan Africa in the power sector. Our investor base, which has grown um, over the last five years, is composed of primarily uh, large institutional investors in the United States and in Europe. And so they are uh, pension funds, insurance companies, uh, endowments from you know large U.S. universities. And being a private company, we were able to have you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with our investors about what we thought would be interesting in the world uh, to invest in and to get them comfortable with the idea of, of owning uh, long-term contracted cash flows coming from assets in uh, Africa. And there was a real benefit to that because the, the first reaction you typically get when you want to talk to an investor about owning cash flows coming from Africa is no. And the second, uh, the second uh, answer is, uh, after no, is let's talk about some other part of the world. And yet, these are the same investors that hold long-term contracted cash flows and look for them uh, all over the, the United States and Western Europe because most of these institutions have long-term liabilities. And if you own a long-term liability, you would really like to match it with a long-term asset. And if you can match that long-term liability with a long-term asset that actually adjusts with inflation, which is the norm in our market, uh, when we develop uh, power plants anywhere in the world, uh, you typically are getting a fixed payment stream from either a government or uh, a private sector participant like a utility, and those index with inflation. So you have an inflation adjustment every year, just like a pension company or an insurance company has an inflation adjustment every year when it comes to keeping their pensioners or their insureds whole. And so these very investors that are in Europe and in the United States investing in things like parking lots, public-private partnerships in the UK with hospitals and schools and prisons, power plants, airports, all for the same reason because infrastructure is seen as a, a separate asset class. They're the right source of capital for Africa's power development and infrastructure development generally. And over and above that, these investors are the largest source of private capital in the world. I mean, th this is where when people say, where's capital formed? It's generally formed in things like insurance companies, pension funds in Europe, and endowments. And so moving that capital into Africa is critical to fill the equity funding gap. The problem in Africa, as people who do 
power development will tell you is not raising the debt capital the debt capital is there it's coming from places like the world bank group from many of the development banks in europe who are focused on providing long term subsidized capital for through debt financing vehicles for infrastructure it's the equity funding gap that you need because for these large projects power projects are very capital intensive and just like when you buy your home some of it has to be equity i guess recently in the united states you don't have to have any equity but traditionally some of it some of it has to be equity and so you have to come up with that equity in the sources of that equity are either the state bad source for a lot of reasons or private companies or publicly traded companies that are that are active in the infrastructure space in a place like africa there aren't many or it's these big sources of capital and so tapping that capital and bringing it to africa is the key to filling the equity funding gap we were able to do that for projects there we have a one hundred megawatt project in togo that we developed and brought into operation in two thousand and ten it took about four years to develop tough project the country had fifty megawatts of electricity for all five million people we put in a one hundred megawatt project in the scheme of things one hundred megawatts is not a lot it would power probably the utility the electricity needs of one of the four quadrants of washington d c but for a place that only had half that much it was a big project getting that done required getting infrastructure investors that are comfortable with that type of project in the developed world to to take a chance in the developing world and how did they get there they got there because we were able to put products on that are probably more important than debt for our investors which are political risk insurance products that are also offered by people like opec and mega the world bank group and other multi lateral providers and those political risk insurance is products are what we needed to to put on to the project to get the infrastructure investor to take a chance with the project in africa because then we could tell them look if something goes wrong here if the you know the infrastructure investor and most of your private investors out there they're not used to investing in africa so when you say africa they say political instability insurrection violence civil war protect me against those things and once you can do that and then protect them against nonpayment through these political risk insurance products you can you can start to take the baby steps to move the capital from where it resides to to where it needs to go to to electrify the the continent and so we've used that i think pretty effectively in the places we are we have five projects in nigeria with the coca cola coca one of coca cola's largest bottlers where we develop effectively what they need inside their fence and then we have a large project that's under construction now in rwanda um, but we've been able to do that because in the private context we can have one on one conversations with our investors and get them comfortable with something that initially they don't want to touch Paul, actually uh, following up on uh, Joe's comments you're a publicly held company and I was just wondering how does that change your sort of the pressures on you and, and raising money and, and financing that may be different than than Joe's being uh, privately held but that's a great question. Um, it's particularly up because Joe used to work with AES and went off to the private sector to, to do this. I think it's th they're actually it, it's probably easier to raise private capital to go do this. It, as a large global company, I think we're able to do some things in Africa um, in moderation. I think we're probably constrained because we can do a little bit. But I think when you've you've got an investor base in the public markets in the U.S. that is probably more quarterly to annually focused. It, it's you can't do too much that's going to have a three to five year type horizon uh, so it, it is um, a little bit more of a challenge I, I do think though um, I, I really do think we're at a turning point in Africa because uh, Latin America went through some very similar things that we're talking about now maybe ten years ago I remember we started doing business in China we had many of the same concerns um, there are now projects out there projects like what Joe and Contour are doing uh, things that AS are doing that are turning out to be successful. And I think what you're going to see is countries are going to see this as a way to move the needle in their electric system that won't cause them to have to go put their capital into developing the electric sector. The benefits are enormous. Um, and I think you're going to see a segregation of countries. Those that decide they're going to do things that in terms of how to do it, people know how to do it now. It's will they have the discipline to go do it. And I think the countries that are going to take the steps to uh, put the right policies in place 
which again, they're not that complicated to figure out, but then have the discipline to enforce those policies, to implement according to those policies, they're going to start to attract a lot of capital. And, and I think you've got folks like Contour that are out there leading the way. But what I've seen in our industry and in other infrastructure industries, as Joe said, once you turn that capital on to a region, it starts to come in force. So I think you're going to see the countries that set these things up properly and and develop a track record are going to get a lot of the capital coming in. And um, you know, it may take another couple of years, another five years, but pretty quickly you're going to see that happen. And it's, it's happened everywhere else we've been in the world. It's really going to depend on the governments that are in place and the institutions and how well they can take things forward. And, and again, develop the trust factor that's needed for the capital that Joe relies on, for the capital I rely on to say those are good investments. Rob, let's uh, turn to, to you for a second. You've got an um, unusual perspective here. You've uh, run energy companies, done investments worldwide in multiple uh, areas of energy, but also were headed up OPEC, which is, a, as Joe mentioned, an uh, important insurance um, agency. So I'd like to get your perspectives on uh, what Paul and Joe have been saying, and perhaps if you have any comments on how the federal establishment in the US could perhaps begin to provide uh, better support for their efforts. Well, thank you, David. Um, one thing that's very clear is that uh, the international financial institutions are absolutely critical to financing uh, power projects in Africa. I mean, commercial banks, uh, even before the difficulties of the last few years, uh, were skittish about this without some guarantee backing them up. Uh, and today, uh, the, uh, the major institutions like the African Development Bank, OPIC, IFC and others are, are, are essential. It, it, they, these projects just can't get done uh, without that financing. And then on top of the financing uh, comes political risk insurance, which is uh, extraordinarily helpful, whether you buy it from OPIC or you buy it from MEGA or you buy it even on the private market. Uh, it's, it's important because uh, in governments and in countries in which uh, there's been state ownership uh, of the power sector, as there has been of many other economic sectors, uh, the idea of inviting private capital in and actually yielding control of the asset and the process to the private sector uh, is a challenging one for many governments. And so you have this kind of push and pull. And you have, we want your money, we want you to invest, we want you to build the plant, and uh, yes, w we'll commit to this power purchase agreement, but then from that moment on, they're going to cut you a thousand times, and you may bleed to death. Uh, they never expropriate the project necessarily, uh, but they can make your life miserable. So uh, an OPIC type institution uh, not only can sell you political risk insurance that protects you against expropriation, including regulatory uh, kind of expropriation, if you will. Uh, it could also protect you where you can't get your money out of the country. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a, another risk. And then political violence. So that's, uh, that's a, a kind of complementary aspect of the financing that I think will make a lot more power investment uh, uh, possible than would be the case. The last part, and perhaps as important as the other two, is the advocacy. When a government starts to backtrack on commitments they've made, whether it's on a power purchase agreement or a concession agreement uh, to, to, uh, uh, to enable you to come in and actually invest and operate a plant, uh, you know, a, a company can go in and pound the table and make the best case they can for why the contract ought to be, off, uh, ought to be uh, recognized and honored. Uh, but Quite honestly, the, uh, the uh, sovereign government intervention from the United States government uh, or from some multilateral institution uh, that already has deep, deep uh, ties to that country is very powerful. So I see this being an essential part of driving more investment into the power sector and the infrastructure uh, in general in Africa. There's an enormous opportunity, as, uh, as Joe and Paul have said. Uh, and uh, it does sort of have a cascading effect. When a few good projects get done, uh, then more project, uh, then more investment comes. And again, as Joe said, the big missing piece is not debt. It's not the uh, because there's a lot of public uh, uh, institution debt out there. The missing piece is private equity, uh, and that's going to come with a little more kind of courage and and uh, examples of success. One other point I want to make. I think that uh, we need to be, those of us that, that are uh, around uh, multilateral uh, development agencies or even bilateral development agencies, we need to be smarter about how we use 
finite public sector resources to enable more power development to take place in other words there are parts of a continuum paul talked about his experience in cameroon where they are sort of an integrated operation but you know then there are people like joe who's building generation and then there's a question of transmission and distribution some of these things are not economic under the best of circumstances if we could use public sector dollars or donor dollars to pay for some of this that then enables private capital investment to go into the for profit part which is the generation side that's a smarter way to spend money last point in that terms of dollars feasibility studies that could be done by or paid for by a i d or u s t d a or multilateral development organizations that look at kind of identifying the feasibility of power development that maybe is not just country specific but regional so that you have a bigger market than the kind of small markets we're talking about would also be a very useful expenditure of public sector resources thanks putting a little bit of my energy hat on there's been and and richard mentioned this earlier considerable discussion about africa's opportunity to leapfrog in terms of technology and as we're looking at climate change we're seeing the pressure is being put on public institutions multilateral development banks institutions in the u s to tilt the support towards clean energy sources to reduce the amount of fossil energy that's being used but at the same time fossil energy resources are quite abundant in africa and i was wondering about your perspective in terms of how does that shape the way in which if you're having to make this strong connection with these types of institutions how does that shape your decisions or what's your perspective on that joe do you want to start i did i realize i need to yeah sure it's a it's a really interesting issue given that you're right when you say that there's pressure on the public institutions particularly lending institutions like the world bank to encourage renewable gener generation and on the continent the issue of course is that the continent has and i always take south africa out of the calculation about fifteen percent of the population sub saharan africa with with electricity and so what they really need is generation of any kind fast the other problem is that renewable generation is more expensive and so if you're if your public lending institution is saying don't do coal do solar or do wind or do any other type of renewable energy they have to also say here's how we're going to plug the tariff gap that's going to be created for the poorest people on the planet togo six hundred fifty dollars per capita g d p so they're going to have a tough time you know paying for thermal generation much less renewable at two or three times higher and what i don't hear when the development agencies say don't bring a thermal project and particularly don't bring me a coal project is how we're supposed to go about persuading governments that need to be persuaded when we say we have an idea for you how we're going to give them renewable energy at the price they would be getting from thermal energy that that renewable tariff gap needs to be plugged if people are really serious about developing renewable energy in the continent given the the generally high cost of renewable power and so it's a it's a real challenge we've tried to take advantage recently of the collapse in photovoltaic panel prices to bring to governments solar projects that would have been unattainable for them to afford even one year ago and figure out a way to kind of plug the gap through some creative financing measures but getting a project done here and there it's not really a policy matter right the question is if you really want renewables then you need a policy and that policy needs funding that's going to bridge the gap otherwise all you're doing is postponing even further the time when you're going to get electricity into the continent you know in the u s as paul knows and in europe there was a time with renewables where everyone said within five years we're going to reach grid parity right meaning we'll get wind prices down to the point that it's effectively the cost of a thermal project i remember two or three years ago when we started to see a lot of push in sub saharan africa to go renewable that the lending institutions would would tell us we have grid parity in africa
but we have grid parity for the wrong reasons is the problem, right? We, the reason you have grid parity in Africa is because generation is so expensive that it actually is the same price as, as expensive renewables. And so I think, it's a t I think it's a tough policy decision to cut off funding for thermal in a place that really needs capacity. If I could comment on that, I, I agree with everything Joe said. And I, it, we, we see this where we, there's a huge need for thermal generation. That's what's going to grow these economies. You need renewables also, um, and the, the, you know, the, the institutions that are, have put constraints on that, and more and more are, are following that line of thinking, you can get them to fund renewables. But the, the thermal plants, which are going to be key to providing affordable electricity, um, many of the multilaterals that have put policies in place are going to be non-players. They are going to be become increasingly irrelevant because there are Asian players who will step in and fill that gap. And in places where that's the situation, we've, we've just gone to um, Asian countries and said, hey, we've got an opportunity for you. They're getting the business. They're getting the jobs. They're providing um, the equipment. So I think there, there are ways to get there. The, the other, on this renewable piece, though, there's an interesting dilemma, and that is that hydro, um, hydropower plants, which depending who you talk to will say, is that renewable or is it not? And, and the general rule of thumb is somewhere around 50 to 100 megawatts a hydro plant becomes magically non-renewable, it's, it's now something else. The problem is, I mean, the opportunity is, in Africa, only 93% of the hydro power resources have not been exploited yet. So it's a huge opportunity to go create uh, carbon-free electricity. But I think, and this is not just multilateral institutions, but it's also commercial banks, whenever you start developing a hydro resource of any size, there's a lot of political fallback. A lot of NGOs jump in and say you shouldn't do it because you're going to be damming up rivers. Um, and that creates a, a, a tough policy issue for banks that want to get into this. But there's a huge opportunity, I think, to provide low-cost power from um, hydropower resources in Africa. In, in places like the United States, we've used up all of our resources. It's done. So it doesn't really matter for us. A place like Africa, it does. So I think there's going to need to be I think some leadership coming from many of the institutions to say, look, this is the right answer. You can do it responsibly. We're going to make it happen for the right reasons in Africa. Uh, but that's, that's it's a real opportunity, but also, I think, a real dilemma for many multilateral institutions. Yeah, I'd like to add that, uh, uh, you know, I think in our enthusiasm to try and steer away from uh, carbon fuels or thermal plants, uh, we've created these dilemmas that uh, are very, very difficult to confront. One is the question of dislocation on a hydro plant when it gets to be of a sufficient size so that you're impacting the population, and that's something that lots of uh, institutions run away from. Uh, and then on uh, other forms of renewable, uh, as Joe said, uh, sadly, the price point is just so high that you have to just decide you're going to subsidize it uh, or somebody's going to subsidize it for some indefinite period of time. Um, there are a couple of things that can be done, but I don't, I don't see this as a long-term solution. You can use donor funds, again, to write down the capital cost of some of these projects so that when you're ultimately trying to recover uh, capital in a return, you start at a much lower figure because, you know, what was a, uh, maybe a, a $100 million plant is now $50 million because uh, somebody paid for $50 million that doesn't expect to be reimbursed. But those, are, those aren't I, – I think that only works in a few places, and it's very expensive. So it's a challenge. I, I would – I do want to mention that uh, I learned the other day that OPIC has a new insurance product, which uh, I think uh, could be uh, of interesting value, and that is that you can buy insurance if a government commits to a feed-in tariff on a, on a renewable project at a certain level and then subsequently reduces that tariff so that you're out of the kind of uh, capacity to recover your investment. <laughs> well, I know. I, I'm just kidding. They're they're committing or they're selling you insurance to help bridge that delta, um, and I think they're looking primarily at India, as I understand. So that's that's I guess one angle to keep. Yeah. An another topic that was um, of considerable discussion during my time at, at uh, DOE, and I suspect is still an issue of interest, is the um, role of regional integration of power grids that can play in accelerating the access to, to energy. And there was considerable work in looking at South Africa, some in Western Africa as areas 
from your perspective as investors and especially from the generation point of view do you see this as something that is a critical importance a little bit of importance as you move forward and trying to build these larger markets Paul do you want to start on that one yeah as an investor I'd say it's it's not top of mind for us because it's it's a longer term this really does require governments to work together on a bilateral basis to come up with ways to do this and it's very difficult this isn't just an issue for Africa it's an issue around the world Central America I think I look back about 15 years ago we talked about the integration of the electric grids in Central America and it was interesting that in our recent strategy meeting the topic again was the benefits of regional integration whenever it comes it takes a long time to get this done but it's it's absolutely it's important it particularly important a place like Africa you can you can share the the hydrology risk between countries you can so there's the people are finding gas offshore the trick with an electric system is to try and keep it as highly utilized as you can run the power plants as much as you can run the grid as much as you can up to full capacity as opposed to having peaks and valleys integration allows you to do that but it it does require governments to work together which is difficult in most places I think it's even even more difficult in a place like Africa where there are shortages but that's where I think you know the developed countries the US can get in there and people have done this successfully and and getting the countries together paying for the studies that's an important part of it the planning that goes along with it there then needs to be some capital associated with it and if you can get the funding for that it's going to make it easier for governments to figure out how to make it work again there's there's a lot of models out there as to where it can work and how it can work effectively but it's going to take it's going to be more of an issue I think for governmental agencies to make that happen from an investor standpoint we're ready to go once it happens but it it's going to take a long time I would add that the developed countries around the world are not necessarily a model for integration of grids so we have our own problems Joe I found interesting that one of the projects you're doing as an investor is the Coca-Cola project in Nigeria. So you're basically working at the industrial level to provide power sort of a smaller scale. I assume that means that they are somewhat independent of the grid then in Nigeria. Is this a model that is unique for their situations or is this one that may emerge throughout Africa where industrial customers basically find a way to finance themselves which means they're not customers then for the grid but becomes necessary for the the sort of the smaller users yes yeah it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting topic we have a relationship with one of coca-cola's largest bottlers in Europe and Africa called the coca-cola Hellenic bottling company and in Europe we we've developed now between Europe and Africa about 17 individual facilities there they're effectively mini power plants with a twist I mean we they're they're extremely environmentally friendly because we're capturing the waste heat off the engine to provide the thermal energy which includes paradoxically chilled water that they need in their processes and then we capture most about 95% of the co2 that otherwise would be admitted out the stack that co2 is then purified and used in the carbonation of the beverage so we've done that with them and in Europe and in Europe it was in Western Europe it was generally a sustainability driven program although the cost of liquid co2 is so high that it actually is one of those sustainability projects that makes sense economically in Eastern Europe it was typically grid reliability and and security of supply so that we were able to provide them these are these bottling facilities run 24 7 the largest one that we serve in Italy is producing over a trillion bottles a year so these are these are massive users of energy in Africa it is it is a response to not having a grid to draw anything from and what's interesting and I've learned kind of watching and getting to know coca-cola is that for the consumer product companies the largest markets for them in terms of future growth are the markets with the least infrastructure and so they've all had to get into the power business and none of them want to be in the power business I mean coke wants to be in the branding business and the and the business of providing carbonated and beverages and juices etc and so we went into Nigeria with them so that they wouldn't have to continue to install their own engines 
and they figured that it would be our capital it would be done more efficiently and it would be developed in a way that would be more innovative than them just going out and contracting for engines and things it's also however a comment on the policy environment in nigeria because i wouldn't be in nigeria providing grid based power i mean we made a decision as a company that despite what is a theoretical attractiveness of nigeria it's just not ready for us at least or we're not ready for them and the risks are just way too high in terms of you know the 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 commercial behaviors and then the risks of you know corrupt business practices etc and so we said you know we'll go into nigeria with coke because we literally will be an island inside their fence selling to them and not selling to the grid and not having to get involved with the government for permits or anything this would all be a relationship with a private party coca cola and so i think Unfortunately, it's also a comment on the environment uh, that we are only inside their fence there. David, if I could uh, add that uh, you know self-generation is uh, is a fact of life in large parts of the developing world. I mean, if you're a business entity and and you're uh, part of an electricity system that's fairly unreliable or uh, well fairly unreliable, then uh, you know you just can't afford to have power go down and, and interrupt shifts and in the middle of things and. Uh, and a lot of that self-generation is uh, is run on diesel, which is expensive, uh, and uh, which does make renewable energy uh, much more affordable, relatively speaking. And there are countries that have renewable energy resources that uh, are, that are in abundance, and that uh, the fuel, therefore, is almost like water. It's virtually free uh, to the power project. Liberia being a great example of a country that had all these fallow rubber trees that uh, are now being turned into wood chips and uh, are going to generate, be used to generate power in Liberia, and I think it's going to be somewhere in the 20 to 25 cent uh, per kilowatt hour. Compared to diesel, that's a big bargain. Uh, but compared to a longer term uh, integrated utility system, uh, it's expensive. If I could comment on it, Joe brings up and, and Rob bring up a good point. Self-generation, it, it's, it's, it's a great way to solve um, an industrial customer's need. The problem with it, though, is you, you typically then, if it, if it becomes too widespread, the grid can't support itself because you lose your best customers, you lose the creditworthy customers, and you, the grid becomes increasingly reliant on people who can't pay or don't pay or do have theft. And we've seen this happen in other countries where you get to a certain point where the grid starts to fall apart. You just can't, it can't work. So it, it really is important for countries um, to, to bring some to, to bring those customers back over time, it, it, and it can be economic ben economically beneficial, but it really is a tough situation where you start to lose the best customers. And, and we've seen it happen elsewhere where the grid then becomes unsustainable as a coordinated mechanism, and then you get away from, it's not even regional integration you're talking about, it's can you even get within the country integration. So it really is important to get the right policies in place. Nigeria, I think, with their uh, upcoming privatization, I think may actually turn the corner. I think that's something we'll all see. But if they do and they can actually get that turned around, you know, it's, it's hopeful other, other companies will be able to say, we're going to go to the grid because it's cheaper, but they're going to need to do that. Well, I think uh, given uh, the, the time, it would be probably an appropriate moment to open this up for discussion with the audience. So um, if, if the panelists are willing to take sort of uh, questions at random here, we'll, uh, we'll do that. Um, do we have microphones? Yes, okay, so a couple of rules of the road. If you can um, identify yourself, um, wait for a microphone. I guess wait for a microphone and then identify yourself. Um, and then if you can, uh, if it's a commentary, perhaps if you want just a response to the comment, um, it, but if it's a question, you know, make sure it's clear what the question will be. And I see a hand right here in the, in the middle. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. I'm <coughs> Ed Barber, <coughs> excuse me, from Good Works International, Andrew Young's consulting firm, and before that, many years in the State and Treasury Departments. I have a question for any and all of you that um, may tie together a lot of the themes we've heard already about renewables versus thermal, political risk insurance, regional integration, and others. And that is Zimbabwe. I was at a panel discussion yesterday with a visiting uh, group of about 30 Zimbabwean 
businessmen looking for investment, and one of the areas where they have needs, as do all their neighbors, is power. Power <coughs> in this context, I think, well, in the first place, we're getting to the stage where we may start to think about the post-Mugabe era, and that obviously is one major requirement. Um, and the power sector is different from many others because of its long planning horizon. At the same time, they now have an indigenization law that is problematic. I don't know to what extent regional, uh, a regional effort might be uh, um, uh, a way to attack that. But I would <coughs> appreciate your comments on whether Zimbabwe is now a ready site for investment in this area and what sorts of steps might be needed to uh, help grease the skids. Well, I, I mean, I think the short answer is no, as you said, <laughs> with, uh, with Mugabe in place. I w one fascinating thing, I, um, I'm uh, not only part of the Frontier 100, I, I have the privilege of chairing the Initiatives for Global Development Board, and, and we had a meeting in New York a couple of days ago in which we had uh, uh, our African business counterparts in town and, and a couple of people from Zimbabwe, and actually since the dollarization of the economy, there's a remarkable amount of economic activity going on notwithstanding the government. But a power project is one that's so deeply ingrained uh, in permitting and governmental uh, engagement that I, I don't think anything can even be considered until Mugabe's gone. But one other dynamic in that area, you know, there are other countries that, are, that were importing power uh, from South Africa. Uh, Botswana being one of them, and my understanding, I haven't, I haven't looked at it recently, but as South Africa has become short on power, uh, guess who gets cut off first, or pretty quickly? So, uh, you know, I think importing power or being part of a regional system when domestic politics intervene uh, can uh, render those agreements pretty useless. I'd agree, and the only thing I'd say is there's, there is a need there. Uh, we're part of the same group, the Frontier 100, and a huge need for power. Um, you know, I, the time is not now, but um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at how we will sit in a panel like this and talk about countries where we won't go in three to four years later. Everybody's running there. It really is going to come down to having the right government in place and the right policies. And if that happens, you can start to attract the investment. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Segero. I'm the president of Segero's International Group, uh, based here in Washington, D.C., and uh, I'm initially from Kenya. Now, what I wanted to ask, thank you for your wonderful presentation. How do you look at the so renewable solar energy in the African, especially the rural areas where the solar is needed using like schools, women, who there are no trees now in the rural areas where we can use the solar energy or the electricity. How do you look at the future of solar energy? And uh, also in uh, countries like uh, Libya, which is now the in Libya and South Sudan, how do you look at it and how can you go about it? Thank you. AES has a solar subsidiary that just does solar projects. Um, it, you know, to date it's been attracted more to Europe and North America because that's where the, the policies are the most attractive. We've started doing some things in India, and we've been looking at a project in South Africa. South Africa, by the way, is, has a band of solar insulation that may be the greatest in the world. So the opportunity is there to do solar, but I think as Joe pointed out, it's still expensive, even with the reduction in panel prices, it's, it's expensive. It's also only providing electricity when the sun shines. So you, 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 you lose the solar capacity at night. What we're spending a lot of time looking into is energy storage, which when coupled with solar could be the answer. The problem is it's, it's very expensive. We're, we're doing a lot of rural electrification projects in places like El Salvador. We're doing a lot in Cameroon. And we're typically finding that it's more economic to provide just build the grid to get to these locations. But in many cases where it's really isolated, a, a combination of wind and solar and batteries may be the cheapest way to go. 
And we think that's the next wave of opportunity is to not have to build all the transmission line, but rather put the money into a, a solar facility and wind, because wind typically blows more at night, solar more during the day, put a battery in the mix. You've actually got something that works for a, for a small community. So we think that's the wave of the future. Yeah, and there's been, uh, there's been a fair amount of, of, uh, of uh, research done and then some, some proposals uh, on these sort of uh, modular units that can be uh, taken into communities. They were uh, looking particularly at uh, rural parts of Afghanistan uh, and you know, sort of villages that had no electricity or, or limited electricity, whether or not you could do school tops, in other words, on the roofs of schools or, or on rooftops, and, and how much power might it generate uh, for how long. Uh, but I think all, we've, all I've seen that, that uh, has real utility is on a very small-scale basis. And then you often have to, if you want to have something around the clock, you need to back it up with, with wind and, and usually a diesel engine. One interesting point about solar uh, in that part of Africa, in East Africa, there, there's a belt that runs through Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, where the irradiation levels are actually on par or better than um, Spain and, and Italy. We, we have a number of solar projects that we've developed and operate in Italy. And in southern Italy, you have the best uh, irradiation in Europe. But this belt in that part of East Africa is actually higher and so if you think about it from the standpoint of comparative resources and comparative advantage, it, it's the right place for these governments to look uh, for developing uh, projects and, and working with the multilaterals to incentivize development of projects. I was in Burundi uh, in August, uh, coupled with a trip to our project that's underway in Rwanda. And when you think about the central East African countries, very good irradiation, but extraordinarily far from uh, ports. And so the cost for the diesel fire generation, as Rob was pointing out, in Burundi, even for a good industrial customer like Heineken, they're paying about 52 to 55 U.S. cents per kilowatt hour for their own generation production. And, and most of that's fuel because it has to be shipped in from Mombasa, which is it's about 1,600 kilometers away. And so with the with panel prices coming down the way they have, and you, you, know, you pick this up in the U.S. when you read about the Solyndra bankruptcy that, you know, what, irrespective of whether the loan was a good idea or not, they really got crushed by what happened in the global pa panel market for, for um, co uh, competitive products. Panel prices have come down to the point where a year and a half ago, ground-mounted solar in a place like Burundi would probably be a 30, 25 to 30 cent project. You can probably do it now for, for high teens, low, low 20s, depending upon your expected and required rate of return. There's something there uh, that, sh that people should look at that, that might make sense and might not require too much funding to, to fill the gap. One thing if I just comment on the uh, rural electrification, one of the things we found is whenever you do this, you're gonna, it's going to be more expensive. You, you've got to find some way to subsidize it through the governments, whatever. What was really interesting to us is the high payment or high collections rate. People that get electricity in these remote areas really want to pay their electricity bills because they really, really need the electricity. And that's something we weren't expecting, but at it's lower rates that they pay, but they all pay. The collection rates are higher than anywhere else we have in our grids and the place where we do this. Paul, in your work in Cameroon, are you doing um, mini grids as well? You know, in terms of when you move to renewables, I mean, you've described the wind and uh, solar. Are they basically setting up smaller grids, or are you hoping to eventually build them back to the main grid? Yeah, smaller grids that we have set up have been uh, typically diesel fire, just because that's been the lowest cost way to do it to date. Um, but it's 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 not efficient, and from an environmental standpoint, not the best. So, w what we're moving towards is looking at ways to do this taking the modular approach like Rob mentioned where you have, but we're, we're not there yet. Thank you. My name is, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Lindsay Ross. I'm with um, CSIS. And I was wondering if the panelists might be able to comment on bilateral investment treaties. Um, the bit with Rwanda was passed in the Senate last week, and I was wondering if that might change investor confidence in Africa and might um, 
maybe boost investment. So. Well, in that about the first bilateral investment treaty we've done in Africa in about 10 years or something. I mean, <coughs> we're so woefully behind on that. That's one of the sort of infrastructure or wiring details that I think government could uh, focus more on, and I think it would help because it would provide investors a little more comfort uh, about the, uh, the, the recourse they have in the event that uh, their investments go bad for political reasons as opposed to commercial. It's one of the first questions that we will ask when looking at a country is, is there a bilateral investment treaty we can rely on? So it's, it's a big plus for us if there is one. Over here, and next question. Oh, just move, work your way across the room there. I'm Nick Snow, Washington editor for Oil and Gas Journal. What is the potential for natural gas to economically generate power in Africa, particularly as LNG exports feel pressure from gas-bearing shales? Uh, the, the, the answer is enormous. Um, the, the problem, as you probably know, is that, and I think the, the sponsor of this event that Chevron has, you know, one of the more innovative integration, cross-border integration projects that's ever been developed in Africa, which is a West Africa gas pipeline that runs out of the Delta region in Nigeria into uh, Togo, uh, Benin, and Ghana, where our power plant is on the, uh, the West African gas pipeline in Togo. The problem is you can, l you can stand in Ghana and see all the way to d the Delta through the West African gas pipeline because it doesn't have any gas in it. <laughs> and, and so the, the potential is enormous between the Jubilee field offshore in Ghana, the Delta uh, gas, the flare gas, which is what the West African gas pipeline was de designed around, uh, fields and you know offshore places like Namibia, fields offshore in Tanzania where the blocks have been developed. I mean, the natural gas should be a source of fuel for indigenous power generation on the continent. It has not been because the incentive has been to liquefy and ship. And I think shale gas and the, the reality of what will drive the U.S. gas market in particular uh, over the coming two decades is going to change a lot the economics of, of the LNG and I think should be an unintended benefit of the development of shale resources in the United States, which will be a lot of this gas should stay home in Africa and, and start providing fuel for power. Joe, I want to thank you for turning this into a real energy event, uh, mentioning both Solyndra and shale gas. So we can't have any ener energy events without those coming up. Okay, uh, just down here in front. Uh, Charles Newstead from the State Department. Um, first, uh, a comment, and that is, I believe you're quite correct in the people who've said that s uh, small and modular is the way to go because a big power plant, whatever kind it is, isn't going to be of any use to you or except in very special places because you don't have the transmission line capacity. And uh, transmission line is very, very expensive and also subject to sabotage by um, various malcontenders. But I really wanted to address my uh, comment to, and the question, to uh, small and modular, who somebody mentioned here, and I think that really is the way to go a in any kind of power plant. And I, being a nuclear person, I'm sorry to tell you that, I, uh, I think that that's one of the solutions that Africa doesn't have, but I it could be offered that if we wanted to. And um, these uh, actually nuclear plants usually are 1,000 megawatts electric, but they can be built in smaller units and thought is being given to that. And uh, that is something I think would be quite important for Africa. We have done some agreement for cooperation with uh, certain uh, selected African countries, as you probably know, and um, we'll probably do more as, as uh, time goes on. And one country of particular interest is Saudi Arabia. We certainly have the money to invest, even though they have the oil and don't really need the power, 
They don't want to burn that, burn that valuable oil. They want to uh, use it to get the money from the hydrocarbons in it and from the various uh, medical values. Now, in order to get a nuclear infrastructure into Africa, you have to have a regulatory framework because it's insane to just introduce nuclear into a country that has never had nuclear and doesn't know how to deal with it. So you have to develop a safety culture. That's one thing. And then you have to have a cadre of people who are educated, some outside the country, some inside the country, to operate the plant effectively. Now, this is all in the post-Fukushima perspective. Well, we expect a nuclear renaissance. There are a lot of people who don't expect a nuclear renaissance now because they say, oh, that was terrible. Look what happened, so many thousands of people. But I want to point out to you that those thousands of people were killed by the earthquake and by the tsunami, not by the relatively few people who were hurt by the radiation from the reactor. So we know how to build safe reactors. We can do that. And I preach this uh, to everybody in um, the Agency for International Development, but they don't want to hear it because AID doesn't like nuclear. But uh, I know Mr. Pumphrey used to be in DOE for many years, so, <coughs> so he understands the importance of nuclear that it could play. And I think the president also has emphasized that it's important to him. And now proliferation is very important. So if we take all those objectives into account, I think we could supply power to Africa. And I know this is getting long-winded, so I'll cut it off very shortly. One other way of doing it, which is easy to do, is floating nuclear power plants. These can be just pulled up to any country that has a port facility, and that floating power plant is really under the control of the country that built it. And it, it can be completely safe and reliable. And furthermore, if they don't pay their power bill, you just disconnect the electricity lines and pull it out. And if there's any non problem, you can do the same thing. The United States once had proposals to do that. We never carried them out, but we once had proposals to consider that. And the Russians are proposing that. Yeah, if I could just comment, I, I, I actually used to work at a floating nuclear power plant. It was called a submarine. So, oh, right. um, and I, I believe nuclear power could be a big part of the mix. I, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to do it in sub-Saharan Africa. It's, I mean, it's worth it's, it's tough to even do gas plants. I think in the near term, gas is really the big upside in, in Africa because there's so much being found. It's simple. Nuclear, I think, is going to play a role. It's, it's clearly going to play a role in South Africa. But I think peop countries are still trying to sort out what the post-Fukushima world looks like. And, and I'd say there's more pessimism than optimism from what I've seen. Thank you for the opportunity to address uh, uh, the panel. Uh, I'm Dr. George Alula. I'm glad because I have a, an engineering degree in nuclear chemistry and a PhD in uh, petrochemistry. I come from Congo. And uh, on the other side, I will say that I'm speaking like an African political leader. I ran for president of Congo in 2006. I missed this one. Maybe next one will come. <laughs> so the Congo, as you all know, that we are uh, rich of so many natural resources. Just the, the starting point is if you invest in Congo, how you will get your money back? We have 20, 23 trillion of gold reserve known and unexploited. So that's the starting point. The second point is that why you need to go to invest in Congo, uh, mostly in the ener energy area, we have one of the most pow powerful hydroelectrical uh, uh, barrage, the, the barrage hydroelectric of Inga, that can provide power to, that is providing power to Zimbabwe in many countries around the Congo. But as you say here, we have one main problem, the transportation. Congo is also on the top five producer of copper in the world. So it's easy to put, to industrialize the copper production to provide the cable to transport the electricity all over the African continent. That's a very huge uh, business opportunity. And also, all those components, we see the light here, 
we don't have those industry. And those industry does not re necessarily require multi-billion to invest in. So this is also the opportunity for the US business to go in Africa, not only on some area like oil production, but also to build those infrastructure and to uh, uh, take advantage of this market. Uh, what is the market size? The market size is 800 million people. Tomorrow, 1.5 billion. So investing in African infrastructure may be a chance to occupy the ground before the China, ta China, China take off for the next 25 or 15 years to come. So my question would be, how do you see we, uh, one point, we come here in the Congolese diaspora, we come with one idea. We say, since we lost six million people in this genocide that is not saying is world, we need 140 billion state uh, bond secured by the US and the G8 country, G8 and G20 country, for which 50% uh, uh, will come from the US. Uh, this is 17 billion a year for the pri private sector. You all know about uh, Warren Buffett. I, I, I'm here, I'm an inventor. I'm paying a respect to uh, Apple founder, Steve Jobs, who uh, passed yesterday. But those billionaires of this time are able to put together 17 billion to invest in this country, to build a co a, the economy of a country which steer up all the African continent economy and create the sustainable peace that we need in the continent. I thank you so much for being patient with me. And uh, just uh, this is just my question. Thank you for my contribution. Thank you. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll, Joe and I will team, on, we'll, we'll team up and go talk to you after this meeting and see what we can do. <laughs> Sounds interesting. It, yeah, you're right. The potential is enormous. I'd love to figure out some way to do something there. <laughs> Okay, well, we, we should talk afterwards, seriously. I, I'd, I'd love to do it. Thanks. And, and good, good luck in your next run. <laughs> <laughs> Take a question here and then one back in the back. Hi there. Uh, ben Springer with David Gardner and Associates. Um, I had a question following up on the lady in front's uh, question regarding sort of distributed solar power. Um, I'm just curious as to what the, the knowledge sharing is like in your field uh, in terms of both regulatory um, technical and uh, the in creative investment mechanisms for particularly the renewable energy, but also Mr. Brandt was talking about CHP projects. Um, a lot of the issues that you seem to face in Africa and developing countries are not exclusive only to the developing world. We're dealing with some of those in the US as well as far as creative financing. And I'm just curious, having sort of a, a unique set of problems in the developing world, but also in a lot of ways, sort of a clean slate. Um, what lessons do you draw from developed countries and what lessons do you share with developed countries? I think that if you look at you know institutional knowledge and learning uh, across technology and, and regulation, the, the multilateral development agencies are actually a, a good facilitator of that. Uh, when you spend time in and around people like uh, the World Bank, the regional development agencies, African Development Bank. There's a lot of excellent policy work going on that integrates experiences on the ground from companies like AES, like ourselves, uh, that is available to anybody who wants to get involved in these sectors. You know, the, most of this dies on the shelf, but the information is there. It's it's digitized. It's it's equally accessible. Um, there is, in the regulatory community, a very high degree of capability uh, across the continent. I mean, what, what you will find even in places that are not familiar with how to regulate the private sector because they've never had a private sector, is you actually will have one or two um, representatives in, you know, the Ministry of Energy or in the public utility that has spent, uh, have spent a lot of time on you know various sponsored exchanges uh, to other countries and to uh, other international regulatory organizations that sponsor uh, training, and you actually have quite a bit of knowledge about uh, 
the different choices and trade-offs in the regulatory space for electricity. Uh, the issue is that the capability set in most of these countries is not deep. And you know, one of the challenges that you face trying to develop a power project appropriately uh, in sub-Saharan Africa is y you really are monopolizing the time and the resources of a few of the more capable people in these ministries for a very long period of time. You're taking them out of the day-to-day, -day, and the day-to-day -day is intensely uh, operational because most of these uh, ministries are also operating what electricity assets exist in the country, and it's intensely political because they're having to work through election cycles at the same time, and you're literally taking a team out of uh, their day-to-day -day and, and, and requiring them to focus on your project sometimes for, for one, two, or three years. Um, and so you, there's, a, there's a great deal of capability in the region. Uh, it's not very deep. Um, I might uh, just add on a little bit to uh, Joe's comments since the time I spent at, at DOE, quite a bit of it in the international field was around the whole question of capacity building and, and much of uh, AID, a lot of AID's work was spent in sponsoring these types of missions. I do worry that, uh, and this is incredibly important because you start building a set of competent people, and I think my experience has always been that in investing, companies coming in as investors want to know that they've got experienced and capable people on the other side of the table going forward. Uh, there's often been pushed forward that companies would like to have inexperienced people on the other side, but that just leads to future problems. I worry that these programs, because they're not uh, flashy, they take time, become very exposed in uh, times that we're having and facing now in terms of budget tightness and uh, budgetary cuts. So I think it's something that I would say from the point of view of the panel that needs to be watched is do we sustain that type of support work that enables an environment to be created for private, uh, private investment that is needed? Do I have one question back here? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Elmira Woods um, from Liberia, working here in Washington at the Institute for Policy Studies. Thanks to CSIS for convening this forum. I guess my, my comments are probably on the opposite of my brother, whom I, I respect and appreciate, but completely disagree with <laughs> in terms of uh, opening up the red carpet to the, the energy sector in Africa. Um, clearly, you know, what we have are tremendous challenges from the Africa side. Um, when you think about the great imbalance, particularly in the power and influence of multinationals in the energy sector, um, the imbalance is extraordinary. And, and the, um, the pressure of these, um, uh, uh, whether it's particularly it's oil and gas, uh, to be able to control decision making here on the U.S. end in terms of campaign finance, but also on the Africa end in terms of making sure that the deal is stacked in their favor. Uh, uh, often creates disasters on the ground. And, you know, whether it's places like Nigeria where, uh, if we were to say Chevron and others, been active since 1956 with disastrous results for the environment as well as for the communities on the land uh, on, on which the oil lies, or um, places like Chad where, I've, you know, I've been in the southern part of the country where, you know, it's relatively new discoveries the last, whatever, six to ten years, but also uh, with, with very damaging environmental costs and, and costs to people's lives and not the, the result in terms of the benefit to communities, the benefit to development, which is the theme of this, this session, and also uh, the benefit to the countries. So, uh, and then, of course, I'm from Liberia, so that's probably newest on the list. <laughs> with Chevron just opening up this year, uh, and, you know, offshore, post-BP disaster, um, very deep offshore uh, p uh, potential there off the shores of Liberia. So, you know, I guess from, from where I sit, the challenges are tremendous. The costs are incredibly high, and the only real opportunities are really for increasing regulation and increasing the power of people in those communities to speak up to take uh, – control of, of their own destiny. And so I guess the questions uh, to the panel are um, first on this question of greater transparency. Even if we take the Liberia, which is the most recent example, issues of uh, now this Global Witness report just released last week of uh, 
uh, illicit deals being made in the energy sector uh, already on, on, you know, uh, on, on the table. To what extent can the panel, uh, which is encouraging investment <laughs> in Africa's energy sector, um, really address those underlying challenges of the resources not benefiting the people, the lack of transparency, the lack of, of opportunities for governments to actually regulate this sector, and, um, and, and the, the lack of opportunity for, e for people to actually benefit from the resources on the land on which they live. I can take a shot at that. <coughs> yeah. Um, well, the history of resource development in Africa would give plenty of people uh, pause about whether or not it's in fact a benefit or a curse. So the history uh, is a sad one for many companies in many countries. However, I think uh, that's not the way it has to be in the future. And so I think certain uh, initiatives that uh, have been undertaken, starting perhaps with the uh, G8 or G20, like the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, is a step in the right direction. For those of you not familiar with that, that's basically uh, an effort to require both developers or producers of resources to disclose all taxes, revenues, et cetera, they're paying, or, or royalties they're paying to the government, and then for governments to account for what they do with those. And Nigeria is actually a member, uh, but, uh, you know, obviously the putting the infrastructure in place to make this work uh, is, is uh, essential. While I was at OPIC, uh, we adopted a policy which was we would not finance or ensure the development of any extractive industry uh, resource without the company we were financing disclosing, regardless, regardless of whether or not the government was doing its part in terms of accounting for it. On the theory that if you're announcing what you're paying to the government in broad daylight and it becomes a matter of public record, then you leave it up to civil society and others and hopefully some sense of political accountability uh, to put pressure on the government to account for what they did with it. Now, I think activities like that are the best chance we have, and uh, I think Liberia has joined EITI. There are other countries that are joining, but that's the direction uh, I think you have to go. And then greater transparency in terms of, of uh, just general governance, and I would say at this point, this is what concerns me about Chinese investment on the continent. It's great to bring this capital in for a continent that's starved for capital. However, it often does not come in in a highly transparent way, which enables uh, people outside of government and sometimes outside of a couple of people in government to know exactly what the deal was. And in fact, it end up perpetuate, ends up perpetuating some of the worst of governance. So uh, I think EITI, uh, as well as uh, the multilateral development institutions that can insist upon uh, uh, rules on bidding and rules on comp competition uh, offers an opportunity to significantly improve uh, what's happened in the past. And last, I would say, you know, American companies, we live by the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, you violate that, and it's up to the Justice Department to prosecute that when they have, uh, when they have true uh, evidence of it. Uh, you know, people go to jail under that act, and that's a level of accountability for U.S. companies that I think you don't have uh, in many other countries. Just make one quick comment. That's that con countries are becoming more discerning also in terms of co companies they deal with. We just, I was just in Vietnam about three weeks ago, and we started construction of a power plant near Ha Long Bay, which is uh, one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And the Prime Minister said to me, we picked you because we knew you were going to develop this project responsibly, and it's important to us because this is a part of Vietnam that's got to be pristine for years to come. So I think governments over time are going to become more discerning about companies they deal with. And I think that's going to add to that, it's covering it from both ends. One, one comment uh, related to, you know, our role as power companies in the, the extractive industry matrix. We, we tend to be, what, what we do, what AES does in a place like Africa, we tend to be aligned with the local communities because our fixed assets are bolted to the ground and our revenues come from the country. We're not producing an exportable commodity in most cases. And so we're typically aligned with those in the community that are trying to encourage large multinational corporations in the extractive industries to both develop the extractive resource 
so the oil, the gas, the, the coal, but to keep some of it home. I mean, we, what, what we need to be successful and to electrify a lot of these parts of the world is for a lot of these commodities to have some portion reserved for domestic use. What you've seen when you go back to you know the history in the 50s, 60s, and 70s is you have a lot of concessions that are given away with conditions attached to the concessions for the extraction of oil and gas, for example, in places like Nigeria. But none of those conditions included reserving some of that potentially power productive fuel for domestic use. And so I think that Paul and I in our businesses find ourselves much more aligned with the needs and the interests of the local community when it comes to how resources that are not yet tapped but available will be developed in the future. Well, unfortunately, I think our time has, uh, has run out in terms of questions. I know there's a few uh, eager, so maybe you can get uh, with the, uh, the panelists at the end. Um, I think this has been a, a tremendous discussion and many different dimensions of the development process and the energy uh, process that uh, will have to be taken into account. I don't know if the panelists have any last sort of points they would want to make to make sure that the, the group remembers what your, your message was. Anybody? Or? Um, okay, in that case, um, join me in thanking our, our panelists for a great job. And, and thank you, thank you to the audience.